when the two men galloped towards one another like medieval mountain jousters. Greasy buckskins and flintlocks in lieu of chainmail and lance. It weren't for no king nor crown. Nah, this little drama was motivated by causes predating nobility, going all the way back to the cave. A violent combination of ego and a woman's love. Endeavors more worthy of bloodshed than royalty ever was or will be, in my opinion. On one side, you had a giant of a French-Canadian by the name of Chouinard. By all accounts, a loudmouth bully with a stomach full of rendezvous rock gut. And on the other, you had a much smaller man, standing just a few inches over five foot, baptized Christopher Houston Carson, or Kit to his friends. And small though he was, you'd be ill-advised to mistake the outer man for the inner. You see, the pint-sized trapper weren't no greenhorn. At 25 years of age, Kit Carson already had damn near a decade's worth of experience west of the Mississippi. First down in Taos as a teenager, learning the lingo and the ways of both the Mexicans and that rough breed known as the Mountain Men. Over the next several years, Carson would travel all across the Southwest, first trapping beaver down in Apache territory before making tracks to Alta, California. And finally, the Great Rocky Mountains, the marrow of the earth. So when Kit rode into the annual Trapper's Rendezvous in the summer of 1835, he had already faced down a good amount of danger. Everything from the Mescalero to the Blackfeet from the Grizzly to a high mountain blizzard. Suffice to say, he weren't easily intimidated and he damn sure wasn't about to take no guff from a dumb Frenchman, no matter how gargantuan the man may be. At least not when there was a woman involved, and especially not out there where there ain't no laws for the brave ones or asylums for the crazy ones. My name's Josh, and you're listening to the Wild West Extravaganza. Yeah! Back in 1806, when Lewis and Clark were making that return trip home from their great expedition, they encountered a couple of guys going the opposite direction. The daring duo, Forrest Hancock and Joseph Dixon, were headed for the upper Missouri with plans to trap beaver the first trickle of adventurers heading into the great unknown. Now, the fur trade in North America goes way back, hell, even out west. Well, before Lewis and Clark, you had the French trading with the indigenous for pelts. You even had British and Russian trade ships on the coast. But by and large, that's what it was, trading. By the early 19th century, however, Americans started looking to cut out the middleman and catch them wily buck-toothed bastards all on their own. A creature whose fur, or plues as they were called in the mountains, was used for clothing. In particular, a type of hat that was all the rage with them uppity Europeans across the pond. A supply and demand type situation that paved the way for my personal favorite period of history, that of the mountain men. An era, by the way, that wouldn't last very long. Roughly just three or four decades, depending on how you look at it. You gotta remember, so little was known of the American West back in the early 1800s that Lewis and Clark were asked to keep an eye out for woolly mammoths on their track west, as well as signs for the lost tribe of Israel. Hell, prior to the Corps of Discovery, the coyote and the prairie dog, even jackrabbits, were completely unknown, at least as far as the proper folks back east were concerned. And over the next 30 years or so, things would remain relatively unchanged, in terms of what we call civilization. Even up to the year 1835, when today's story takes place, the interior of what's now the western United States was, for the most part, untamed and untouched. Now, I know that's very much a sweeping statement, and I am fully aware you did have Mexican settlements down in the southwest and along the west coast. You had the French up in Canada, not to mention the hundreds of thousands of Native Americans that occupied the interior. But then Mexican towns were a long ways away from the Wind River Range or the Yellowstone River. And St. Louis, the closest vestige of United States civilization, was twice as far. This was before the Oregon Trail, before the California Gold Rush. We're talking the entire areas of present-day Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, Idaho, North Dakota, South Dakota, Utah, Nevada, Oklahoma, half of Texas, half of the states of Arizona and New Mexico, a big chunk of California, all a vast wilderness. No stores, no barbers, no libraries, no doctors or dentists or saloons, no churches, and no law. The last episode I did on Wild Bill Hickok, I spoke of how lawless the boomtown of Deadwood was. Now imagine that times a million. You venture out west in 1835 and you were on your own hook. Should you encounter trouble, weren't nobody coming to help. 
not even mama. Any justice that was exacted was done so by brute force. As you can imagine, this led to men oftentimes resorting to violence to settle disputes, much like what happened with Kit Carson and that Frenchman at the 1835 rendezvous. Ah, the rendezvous. That annual gathering where fur trappers sold their pelts, or plues as they called them, and resupplied for another season in the High Lonesome. An undertaking that also just happened to be one huge ass party. For weeks on end, these veterans of the mountains would have a grand reunion, swapping stories and lies, drinking ungodly amounts of watered-down whiskey, and gambling and fornicating. And of course, they would mourn those who went under. When a familiar face didn't show up for rendezvous, you could be next to certain that they were done for, their bones bleaching some spot not yet named on the map of the Magnificent. Now this was an organized endeavor. The large fur companies would put together wagon trains and drive all the way from St. Louis to the predetermined rendezvous site, essentially turning the festival into a big trading fair. This worked to the trappers' advantage as it stopped them from having to make a months-long trip back east to sell their winter's worth of plues. But this convenience came with a cost. Not only would they not get top price for their pelts, but the supplies they would desperately need come summer came with an awful markup, sometimes up to an astonishing 1,000%. This would be like a gallon of milk costing like $4,000 in today's money. And I don't know if you've been to the grocery store lately, but damn, we getting there, cuz. No money passed hands at the rendezvous, by the way. Leastways not from trader to trapper. The beaver plues would be graded on size and quality, whereupon the trapper would be given credit at the goods counter or wagon or whatever the hell the merchants would have set up. And that's where you'd go for your supplies. And brother, if you had any sense at all, you'd stock up on the essentials before you even thought about taking that first swig of whiskey. Now as to what a trapper would need to buy, it all depends. Keep in mind this was the era of the single shot black powder firearm. Your average mountain man carried more than one rifle and several pistols, some of which might need to be replaced and or repaired. And then there's all the stuff you need just to maintain these firearms. Caps and nipple huggers, maybe some spare flints. And of course, plenty of powder and lead. And these firearms were not just for self-defense. Meat was the staple of every mountain man's diet, just like the natives that they worked so closely with. As such, a trapper's long rifle was his grocery maker. Buffalo, elk, pronghorn, mule deer, bear. They dined on it all, even the beaver whose big, flat, scaly tail was considered a delicacy. I ain't never had it, but from what I understand, it's all pretty much gristle. Which makes sense, considering how everything else they ate was so lean that they were oftentimes starved for pure fat. And once you had your firearms taken care of, your next purchase there at Rendezvous would be the actual tools of your trade, the traps. Just like your guns, you'll need to have several traps repaired as well as replaced. And while you're at it, you might as well lay in for some spare awls to tend to your buckskin and plues, and some extra axes and hatchets, and a shit ton of butcher knives. Maybe you need a new iron kettle. Definitely going to need some extra blankets. I mean, it gets cold up in the mountains in the wintertime. And besides, blankets are always a good trade item. And trust me, you're going to need a whole lot of trade goods. Likely or not, you'll end up wintering with some friendly Shoshone or Crow or maybe the Ute. And not only will they want you to come bearing presents, but it'll make your stay a whole hell of a lot easier. If you didn't already have you a Native American wife to make you some new clothes or moccasins or maybe a stock of dried meat and pemmican, you could trade for that as well. And when it comes to trading with the indigenous, you're going to have to do a lot better than a few blankets. Pack up as many beads, mirrors, trinkets, various colored swaths of cloth, and as much paint as you can. Remember, many of these items are going straight to the lady of the teepee and Native women are like women everywhere. They like looking fly. Once you've got your trade items secure, then you move on to your comfort items, the stuff that probably won't last you till next rendezvous, but will nevertheless make life a little more bearable for a few months at least. Coffee, flour, tobacco, maybe a little pepper, some sugar if you've got a sweet tooth, dried raisins, or some other type of fruit. And then, and only then, do you go get your drunk on. That's when the orgy really begins. Now, as far as Kit Carson was concerned, he was always a little bit more reserved. And at this particular rendezvous especially, he had more pressing matters. The man was 25 years old, in the prime of his life, and already highly respected among his peers. And apparently, he figured the time was right to get himself a woman. A real full-time night woman. 
Now, there were no white ladies at the rendezvous. Not really. This was the year that the Reverend Dr. Marcus Whitman attended and cut that arrowhead from Jim Bridger's back. And Marcus had him a wife by the name of Narcissa. But no, it weren't no American or even a Spanish beauty that Carson had his eyes on. It were an Arapaho maiden by the name of Singing Grass, a handle more accurately translated as the sound created by wind whipping through the tall prairie grass. Remember, it wasn't just trappers and traders who attended this annual mountain gathering. Various friendly tribes would show up to do business as well. Nez Perce, Flathead, Shoshone, and apparently in 1835, some Arapaho. And they, just like the mountain men, were there to do business. And yeah, have a little fun in the process. The men of these tribes would engage in extracurricular activities as well. Gambling and drinking, racing and wrestling. You know, a typical night out with the boys. As for the women, this was their chance to lay hands on some of those trade items previously mentioned. The married ladies would want all kinds of modern accoutrements aimed at making their lives easier and brighter. And the single gals, well, they might just be on the prowl for a man. And yeah, marriage between trappers and native women was common. Which brings us back to Kit and Singing Grass. Evidently, she was a looker as she not only caught Carson's eyes, but the attention of the big Frenchman, Chounard. Now this son of a bitch here, also known as the Bully of the Mountains, was everything I loathe in a man. A loud, obnoxious, swaggering douchebag who used his size to try to intimidate others. Add in a whole bunch of whiskey and Chounard was likely unbearable to be around. One English adventurer described the Frenchman as a quote-unquote stupid-looking man, with Carson claiming that he was overbearing. But what's the big deal? You know, this is rendezvous. There was a lot of loud, obnoxious drunkenness going on. But not everybody had the cojones to mess with Carson's lady-to-be. Apparently, there was a ceremonial dance and singing grass picked Kit out of all the other suitors to be her dancing partner. This enraged the bully Chouinard, and he began hurling obscenities her way. Where it is, later that night, he laid in wait, caught singing grass alone, and tried to have his way with her. Luckily, she was able to escape. And it looks like Kit may have found out about what happened. If not, then he was still smarting over Chouinard's insults from that dance the night before. Because when that big Frenchman made his way over to Carson's camp looking to pick a fight, the smaller man was more than willing to oblige. Now, most people were used to Chouinard's blustering ways and just simply ignored him. But when he started sauntering around calling the Americans muling schoolboys and boasting that he could take a switch to all of them, Carson by God had had enough. He stood up and said that he was the worst damn American in camp, and furthermore, he would take no such talk from any man. Witnesses would later claim a quote-unquote peculiar smile spread across Kit's face as he warned Chouinard that if he didn't shut his mouth, he'd rip his damn guts out. Carson's words, not mine. Challenge accepted. Both men broke in search of weapons and mounts, and once they were healed, galloped towards each other at a breakneck speed, finally screeching to a halt so close that the heads of their horses touched as words were exchanged. Sadly, we don't know what these words were, but I'm sure they weren't anything you'd want to repeat around your mammal. Next thing you know, both combatants raised their pistols and shot simultaneously, at point-blank range. The ball from Chouinard's flintlock grazed Kit's face, leaving a scar under his left ear he'd carry for the rest of his life. Whereas Carson's ball ripped through that damn French-Canadian's hand, blowing his thumb clean off. As Kit went for his second pistol, Chouinard held up this mutilated appendage and began begging for his life. Sacre bleu, Monsieur Carson, why you try kill me? Me only play, I just JK you, my bad. I no try rape your petite ami. No, Monsieur Carson, look, I no want die. I no want long au revoir, mon ami. Hey, what's say we get whiskey and listen to Lady Gaga, huh? Typical bully, right? Always tough until they ain't. And yes, that uh, that was me trying to do a French-Canadian accent. So here's the thing. This little fracas between Carson and Chouinard is a pretty famous duel. If you've read much about the history of this particular era, you've probably heard about it. I know I've read several different accounts over the years, and the frustrating thing is, nobody knows exactly how it ended. That part has somehow been lost to history. The story simply ends with Chouinard begging for his life. Carson would later say of the incident that the camp, quote, had no more bother with this bully Frenchman, end quote. And there is a version of the story that makes the claim that Kit did not, in fact, fire that second pistol. 
that Chouinard's wounded hand got infected and the gangrene did him in. That said, there is another account that says Carson did go ahead and pull the trigger on that second pistol, ending the man who allegedly tried to rape Miss Singingrass. Either way, like Carson said, they had no more trouble with this bully of the mountains. And guess what? Kit got the girl. That's right. He asked the young lady's father for her hand in marriage and tossed in three mules and a brand new rifle just to sweeten the deal. The two lovebirds would get hitched in the traditional Arapaho fashion. The ceremony held in her father's lodge, and once the ritual was complete, a blanket thrown over man and wife as the father of the bride gave a blessing. A feast was then held in their honor as some of Singing Grass's kinfolk erected a teepee for the newlyweds. And if you're thinking that anything else got erected that night, well, you might actually be wrong. It was a tradition of the Arapaho to not immediately consummate the marriage. And by consummate, I mean making love. That horizontal tango. That funky monkey. That bump and grind. And while the two likely slept in the same bed together that night, singing grass, if she followed tradition, and yes, I do realize this is a big if, they were a human, but she would have worn a tight rope around her waist, a chastity belt of sorts. This would have lasted a few weeks following the marriage, I guess just in case one of them had second thoughts. That way, if they split up, the native beauty's honor would still be intact. As it were, that would not be the case for Kit and Singing Grass. There's absolutely no indication that their marriage was anything but a happy one. Carson's new bride was described by various sources as being, quote, a good girl, a good housewife, and good to look at. A winning combination in any man's book. By the way, the Arapaho were renowned for their intricate beadwork, and as such, Singing Grass made sure that her husband's buckskins were all beautifully adorned, as well as his moccasins, even his tobacco pouch. Kit would later recall, quote, She was a good wife to me. I never came in from hunting that she did not have warm water for my feet. End quote. And if that's not true love, then I don't know what is. Married or not, Carson still had to earn a living, though. The season following this 1835 rendezvous, he'd work for the Hudson Bay Company as well as the season after. Later on, he'd sign up with Bridger's Brigade and work the waterways between the Yellowstone and the Bighorn. And really everywhere else. I mean, the years directly following his marriage to Singing Grass, Carson would travel all over present-day Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, even Utah. And this was before he ever started guiding Vermont. And when he could, which was often, he brought his bride along with him. These were shining times that Kit would later describe as the happiest of his life. That he took much pleasure in those days in the mountains far from the habitations of civilized man and with no other food than that which he could procure for himself. And what a life that must have been. You know, the freedom of the wilderness along with a loving wife. And by the time 1837 came around, a brand new baby girl who they named Adeline. Unfortunately, the beaver market was on the decline at this point and a man had to trap more and more just to make ends meet. And thanks largely to the skill of the fur trappers, the beaver were quickly becoming extinct in many areas where they once teamed. This meant you'd have to travel deeper into the unknown or dangerous territories hoping to find a body of water thus far untouched by the white man's traps. At the same time, there was a big economic depression back east and a smallpox epidemic out west that was absolutely devastating to the Native Americans. In some cases, entire tribes were wiped out. And that's not an exaggeration. One out of every 10 Native Americans living along the Missouri River died during this epidemic. And on top of all of that, then beaver felt hats were falling out of fashion in Europe. The people opted instead for silk hats. No demand for beaver meant that the prices would plummet and it would no longer be financially viable to spend all winter freezing your balls off in mountain streams. And if all that wasn't bad enough, tragedy struck Kit Carson up close and personal by 1839. Singing Grass gave birth to another daughter, whose name is unknown, and quickly developed a fever. The Arapaho medicine men did their best, but to no avail. The sickness overtook Singing Grass, and she passed away, just four short years after she and Kit tied the knot. Once again, if tradition was followed, Singing Grass would have been placed on a platform, high up in a tree with her favorite possessions, and then torched, for this was the way of the Arapaho. A sad ending to today's story, I know. I mean, the first part is a little bit motivational. Like young King David, Kit defeated the Goliath of the mountains, proving that size doesn't determine the man, and that it's what's inside that really counts. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I'm no Kit Carson. However, I do think we all have a reserve of strength and courage deep inside of us that we can pull at in times of trouble and hardship. And the second part of the story is kind of a reminder that life is short. Shorter for some than others. I doubt young Singing Grass was yet 25 years of age when she passed away, leaving Carson a widower with two young children to care for. Just a reminder to not take your loved ones for granted. Hold them tight and let them know you love them. When your time comes, and it will come for all of us, that'll likely be first and foremost on your mind. All right, short episode today. As you can see, we are back on our fortnightly or every other week schedule. Next episode, two weeks from today, we will be headed west to California and taking a dive into the Modoc War, learning all about Captain Jack and the Modoc people. Old Kit Carson had him a run in with the Modoc as well, by the way. A different story for a different day, one that also has a not so happy ending. Interesting guy, Kit Carson. Many consider him a hero, while others just simply a butcher. And to be perfectly honest, at various times, both descriptors certainly fit. If you're interested in learning more about Carson, I cannot recommend the book Blood and Thunder enough, written by Hampton Sides. And if you're a member of my Patreon, then you may recall this little tell from the series I did on Kit Carson way back when. Thought I'd sort of reword and repurpose it for today's episode. Also, speaking of books, I forgot to mention that my series that I just wrapped up on Wild Bill Hickok, my primary source for that was Joseph D. Rose's book, They Called Him Wild Bill, which I also highly recommend. It's not an easy read, but it is chock full of details. As always, thank you for listening. Big thanks to all my new patrons, as well as my YouTube paid members. Thanks to everybody who's been donating to the cause via Buy Me a Coffee. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thanks for listening. Please, if you like what you hear, share this episode with a friend or an enemy. And until next time, watch your top knot. Keep your powder dry. And don't go picking no fights with no midgets. Adios. Here we get whiskey and listen to Lady Gaga.